Live from Keene, New Hampshire, the most watched TV news show in Keene. The Keene Weekly News with Mark Edgington. Coverage of local and national events starts now. This is Mark Edgington, and you're watching the Keene Weekly News. Thanks. Today is August the 24th, 2007. Let's get into the news, shall we? Big news this week, the roundabouts apparently are moving quite along. Um, this weekend, the main Marlboro Winchester roundabout, we should come, out, come up with a shorter name, I think we need to. How about the expensive roundabout? Let's call it that. $4.2 million. Let's call it the expensive roundabout. So from here on out, the expensive roundabout is the main Marlboro Winchester roundabout. It'll be open for uh, Keene State College's move-in week. So the, the college kiddies are coming back, and uh, apparently 2,200 of them will be moving in over the weekend, so we need to get them moved in. But then once we've moved them in, because of the sweetheart deal that uh, Keene has with the, um, the college, we'll be shutting it right back down. It'll be shut down until um, September the 3rd. Now, from what I can tell, you can drive on the thing already, but uh, apparently they don't want to stop the flow of traffic to uh, do a little painting and put pretty little shrubs along the side and some lighting and things like that. So uh, expect pretty much the first week of September for it to be uh, open. At least that's what the uh, Keen Sentinel says. And of course we know, the Keen Sentinel is always right. Speaking of media sources that are always right, Cheshire TV needs your support. So if you're watching right now, go ahead and send them a check. They could use it. Also, roundabouts, apparently they're claiming that 101, the roundabout on uh, the corner of Winchester and 101, and there where it ties into 9, 10, 12, the whole mess. Um, that's going to be... They're getting finished with that, and once they're done, it should ease up the traffic tie-ups that are going on in there. And I'll tell you what, there certainly are some traffic tie-ups. People have not figured out how to handle this two-lane merging into the two-lane circle thing. The I, I, I come up often, up 101 from uh, South Main, and the traffic is always just backed up at least halfway to South Main, if not all the way to South Main, where you're merging in. So... Um, Hopefully this roundabout thing will get better, but, uh, you know, I guess roundabouts really aren't my problem. My problem is taking Tom Eaton's property without his permission. Now, I know we paid him, um, that the city of Keene decided to pay him some generous sum for the little sliver of land that they took from him, but it was his. He didn't want to give it up. I sincerely hope that uh, they never come and take my land or your land and decide to give us what they consider a generous sum, and then do whatever they want with it. And I'm even so generous as to hope that the city councilors, the nine of them that voted for it, um, and the mayor who is now stepping down, I hope that nobody comes along and next time, because there's going to be you know a whole new round of elections coming up here in uh, uh, October, November, I hope no one comes along and takes their houses and knocks them down and turns them into a park for everybody's better good. Maybe a park where we teach kids not to steal. article out of the Keene Sentinel here. It's focus on student safety. Um, with freshman orientations this month, campus safety is a, a hot topic in the wake of the Virginia Tech slayings. So many colleges are focusing on uh, campus safety. You know, I gotta kinda wonder, in the case of Virginia Tech at least, I can't tell you about every problem that goes on and uh, as far as campus safety, but in the case of Virginia Tech, if a few of those uh, college students had had uh, the right to carry guns on the campus, which was outlawed by Virginia law for that particular college, just that one from what I can tell, if they had been allowed to carry guns, they'd have just smoked Mr. U, or whatever his name was. Just wouldn't have killed 27 people. you're sending your kid off to college, a safe college student is an armed college student. Here in New Hampshire, all you have to do to have a concealed weapons permit is go to the sheriff. I think it's a $10 fee, and it's called a shall issue permit because the sheriff shall issue it to you. Um, you know, they, they pretty much have to do that. 
Unless, of course, you're a convicted felon. If you're a convicted felon and you're trying to make your life better, you're not allowed to protect your family. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Can't protect your family if you're a convicted felon. If you're the wife of a convicted felon, nope, you can't have a gun either because your husband might get it. Or spouse, I guess I should say, because there's plenty of convicted felon women running around out there, right? I suppose if you're the adult child living at home, you can't learn how to use firearms either. So apparently we're disenfranchising this entire segment of our population, these convicted felon people. The way I see it, if you commit a crime with a gun, you've committed a crime. You should be charged with the crime. The crime shouldn't be having the gun. A gun is a tool. A convicted felon could kill somebody with a hammer. He could beat them to death with a maglite flashlight. He could stick them with a pitchfork. Why guns? Speaking of college news, UNH made seventh on the party list. Now here's an, ooh, here's a dark title to, to get for your uh, college. The University of New Hampshire was ranked seventh in the Princeton's Review's annual list of top 20 party schools. West Virginia University is number one. They're partying out in West Virginia, dancing with their sisters and stuff. After finishing third last year, West Virginia is up. The rankings are uh, contained in the 2008 edition of the best um, 366 colleges. This is going on sale Tuesday and is based on a survey of 120 college students at these schools, mostly during the 2006-2007 school year. Number two on the party list was the University of Mississippi, followed by Texas, Florida, and Georgia. My alma mater, University of Florida, we always make the list. From my experience at college, I'd like to say, make sure that your student is ready for college. Because if they're not, you're paying for a very, very expensive four-year party. And, in more news about lists, New Hampshire making lists, Peterborough was uh, designated a cool place to live. The town was named as one of Budget Travel Magazine's 10 Coolest Small Towns in America, a list that magazine editor Eric something said celebrates the towns where uh, it really feels like something new and exciting is going on. Something new and exciting is going on in Peterborough. I drive through there all the time. I didn't even know. The article will appear in the September 2007 issue of the magazine, which debuted on Newsstands Tuesday. It notes Peterborough's artsy reputation, citing McDowell Colony and uh, lauding the town for having two local theater groups. The other nine spotlighted were Collinsville, Milford, and a bunch of places all over. That's fun. Peterborough got named to a little list. It says it's a nice place to live right there on the sign. It must be true. Brattleboro. Speaking of, speaking of interesting places to live, Brattleboro has nixed, nixed its nudity ban. They just couldn't handle the pressure of locking people up for running around naked in, how, in town. It's uh, back to clothing optional in Vermont's nudity capital. A month after passing the temporary ban on public nudity, the Brattleboro Select Board rejected a proposed ordinance that would have made it permanent, um, permanent on Tuesday when the emergency or ordinance expires next month. So that means if you go to Brattleboro now and get naked, you'll get in trouble. But if you go next month and get naked, you won't. Of course, it was 50 degrees when I got up the other day in August, so I wouldn't be running around naked. Anyhow, we in this uh, country are going down a slippery slope, says... Dora. She said it was up to uh, the town to restrict the right of people to be nude in public. Before the vote, residents weighed in on both sides of the debate with one opponent um, handling the select board a petition of 900 handing, excuse me, um, 967 signatures of the people of Brattleboro and Wyndham County who support a nudity ban. Apparently a thousand people in Brattleboro and Wyndham want a nudity ban in Brattleboro. The permanent ordner, ordinance was rejected in a 3-2 vote, which would have prohibited public nudity downtown along routes 5 and 9. I don't know. It's a big deal. People running around naked. I suppose it is if you're trying to run a business. Speaking of running businesses, bar owners are bracing for the smoking ban is the big, big headline here on the uh, Keene Sentinel. And then the byline... They say they don't expect to feel financial impacts. So they're bracing for not feeling financial impacts. Did two different people write these headlines? 
I'm wondering, did, did the guy who wrote Bar Owners Brace for Smoke Ban, did that guy write the article? Or did the editor just slap that on to sell a few more newspapers? It's right there at the top. Keen Sentinel, Bar Owners Brace for Nudity Ban. So, apparently they want to sell a few papers and they don't expect you to read the byline that says, ah, they don't expect any trouble. I do have to say that I would expect some bars are going to do better and some are going to do worse. I don't expect the people that go out and drink in bars to stop going out and drinking in bars because they can't smoke. There are probably going to be some people, probably mostly cigar smokers. Those folks, they really relish their time with their smoking implement. The cigar smokers, maybe they'll stay in and have a glass of, um, you know, scotch or port or whatever it is that they drink when they smoke these things. They might stay in, but I, I, I can't see much more than a 1% or 2% uh, change in, in uh, bar revenue. But what I would say is that bars that currently now are smoking versus bars that are not smoking now, there's going to be some changes. For instance, Applebee's. Now, um, Kaylee's, uh, Callie's Sports Pub, Kaylee's, no one's ever... I've never, found, I've never met Kaylee, so I don't know. Um, Kaylee's Sports Pub, pub on uh, Main Street, it's a sports bar and you can smoke. Now, Applebee's, it's a sports bar and you can't smoke. I'll bet you that when smoking's outlawed, that it's likely that some of the people that are going to Cali's will think, eh, well, I can't smoke here, I can't smoke there. They probably won't think this, they'll just, you know, naturally intuit it. They'll probably end up going to Applebee's instead. There's no, there's no reason not to. They're not disincentivized to go to Applebee's, so they're likely to go there. So I think that, they're, that bars will see a change in revenue. The uh, Cali's owner here, Kevin Coronis, he doesn't expect to see many problems, and you know, maybe that's so. He is walking distance from the college, and everybody knows college students drink. So they'll probably continue, but uh, I think there'll probably be some, some effects noticed. I don't think that that's really the issue, though. The issue is, if I buy the land and I put a bar in it, or if I rent a bar from the bar, um, from whomever I'm renting it from, it's my bar, right? My bar, I bought the land. Shouldn't I be allowed to let anyone smoke in that bar that wants to smoke? Now I know, what about the bartenders and waitresses? They have to work there and they're going to get smoke in their lungs and we all know that secondhand smoke is ten times as deadly as regular smoking. Well, for one, you've been lied to about secondhand smoke. It's ludicrous that uh, secondhand smoke can kill people. You don't, you're, not even, you're smoking diluted smoke way out here in the air and it's not like you're locked up in, inside of a AMC gremlin with these people you know it's a bar and if you don't like it you can go sit outside or you don't have to go to that bar there is Applebee's that's a choice the waitress waitresses and bartenders at Kaylee's probably want the patrons to smoke and enjoy themselves and when they're enjoying themselves they probably tip a little more so I'm of the opinion that if it's if the bar belongs to that person, you shouldn't be telling them whether or not they can smoke in there. Apparently our politicians are not of the same opinion. And I always wonder, who are these people and why are they telling us what to do? Seems like they just, you know, they spend all day over there. All day in Concord, thinking of things to tell us to do. Can't they just leave us alone? I mean, weren't we getting along fine? Aren't we getting along fine right now? You can smoke in bars. Isn't everything fine? Why do we need this law? I'll tell you, somebody's smarter than you are. Somebody out there knows better how to live your life than you do. Well, I tell them to go jump in a lake. Jump in Lake Winnipesaukee. Here's a reader opinion that I particularly liked. School board ignores voters' wishes. It's as August 28th approaches, the day we voters will be asked to approve the newest proposed teacher's four-year contract prepared by our keen Board of Education and the Teachers Union, I find myself pondering some facts. Last March, the voters of Keene rejected the proposed new school budget. Thus, the default budget was adopted. At the same time, the proposed three-year teacher's contract would have cost the taxpayers $2.9 million over, three year, over a three-year period. It was also rejected. This total sum would have broken down to as little as one million per average year. 
We are now asked to vote on a four-year contract totaling a cost of $5.1 million as reported by the Keene Sentinel, June 27th. That is $1.3 million in a year. Now, I know we're being told, I, I got a flyer in the mail, it must be true. I got a flyer in the mail that said that this contract is fair. But I seem to recall getting being told by the teachers union that the last contract was fair too. Now, I don't know about you, but it really bothers me, really bothers me that here in Keene, the taxes on a house, a $200,000 house, just your pretty average run-of-the-mill house, nothing special going on in a $200,000 house. Believe me, if there's something special going on, the tax assessor's office would know about it, and it'd be a $400,000 house, right, off the, right, right from the get-go. Then you'd be paying $10,000 a year. Now, $5,000 a year from the average citizen is just too much. Most of that budget, Six, about 60% of the annual budget for your taxes goes to schools. I have the feeling that we could make it on less. And that's what this, uh, this uh, re um, reader and writer to the uh, Keene Sentinel says. Apparently the uh, default budget of $750,000 a year, they're making it on that now. Why can't they make it on that in the future? Our kids are getting educated, right? Now. I don't think that we should be, uh, I, I don't think that, that people that don't have kids in the school system should be forced by the threat of losing their house to pay for it. It seems crazy to me, um, ludicrous to me, that uh, the public schools are such a bad idea that they have to threaten to pay, take people's houses away in order to get it paid for. I mean, that's really the issue. Do you want to pay for other people's kids to go to school? I mean, what if you have no kids? Now, my wife and I are trying to have a child. I'm not going to send it to public school. Why? Because I don't believe in stealing. As a matter of fact, at uh, Cheshire, Dartmouth, Keene, Hitchcock thing, the hospital down there, they offered me assistance because I don't have insurance. Now, I have no intention of giving these people my financials. Um, as far as how much money I make or anything like that, I don't share that kind of information with people. But that's the reason I wouldn't take that money either. Because my mom told me not to steal. And I know that that money was taken from taxpayers and they were forced to give it. So I'm not going to be involved in it. In the same way, I wouldn't send my kid to public school. Besides, I feel like our public school systems have taken teachers and turned them into bureaucrats. They don't incentivize them in the same way that private schools do. I think that private school teachers, I've gone to both private and public schools, and it's, you know, this is my experience. This isn't any kind of deep study I've done or anything like that, but I can tell you I was on the dean's list in eighth grade. That's the highest you can get. The dean's list in eighth grade. In ninth grade, I went to public school. I just had to go. I wanted to play sports at public school. They had football. It was going to be fun. I failed two classes that year. I went from dean's list with a three point eight or 3.9 grade average, and I failed two classes the next year. Now, I don't know why. You know, your kid, ninth grade, 10th grade, it's hard to remember what's motivating you back then, but uh, it seems to me that probably I didn't have the, same, the right attention from the teachers. I can definitely tell you that the uh, public school teachers didn't care quite as much. Just, a, just an observation. I'm sure that there are public school teachers out there. I can name some that really did care. But they're trapped in a system, in a big bureaucratic system, where it's very difficult to make headway. Whether it's the teacher's union, whether it's the administration, I don't know. Somehow my school, uh, my private school, managed to make it on four administrators. Four of them. I wonder how many we have in Keene. Just a, I, I know that whole, that, that building that they're supposed to be selling on West Street. Well, that thing's just full of administrators for the school. We're paying them all. That's what part of that budget's going for. We've got to administrate the schools. Can't we just teach the kids? Wouldn't it be a lot easier? Apparently higher gas taxes and tolls are coming. To hear Transportation Commissioner Chuck O'Leary tell it, this is a watershed moment for the state's roads and highways and bridges. In short, O'Leary says the state has made too many promises at a time when construction costs are surging and tax and toll revenues aren't keeping pace. How many times have you heard this? 
the, the bureaucrats love to beg for money. We just can't do it. We cannot do it. It's impossible with the amount of money we've been given. Cannot do it. I've heard it time and time again, and I don't even believe it anymore. Now, I'm not against gas taxes. I think the gas taxes are probably the best way to fund roads. I'm not against tolls. I figure if you want to drive on the road, road you can pay the toll. But what I am against is paying $200,000, excuse me, $5,000 on a $200,000 house every single year. The state gets a large chunk of that money for its little roads, and then they want to tax me on the toll roads. And then they want to tax me on my gas consumption. And what about the hybrid cars? They're not getting taxed as much as regular cars. It seems like you've got a big conundrum here. I don't know. The fact is, as long as you have bureaucrats, they're going to be begging for more money from the legislature. And the legislature is going to up its budget every single year faster than inflation goes up, faster than you, the, the cost of living increases that you get go up. More and more. You know, currently, I want you to think about it. The average, just think about taxes for a minute. How much of your money do you pay in taxes? And when it comes to income tax, you know, the average family, let's say they pay 25% of their income in taxes. Eh, 25%, that doesn't seem like the craziest thing. Now, I go to, I go to church on a pretty regular basis, and, and I'm familiar with the Bible. It said that um, God wants 10% of what you make. Somehow government must be a lot more important than God, because they're getting a lot more than God wants. God wants 10%, the government wants 25%. Hmm. Seems to me that Christians shouldn't, uh, should vote against any kind of tax increases be simply because the government is not as important as God. There's no reason for this. Now, 25% in income taxes, but then let's say your family makes, I don't know, $75,000 a year. Then they take out, uh, you know, so that's going to be um, 32000 18, 16,000 a year is going to go in taxes. Whew, that's what the IRS gets. Now, let's not forget that, uh, and, and probably included in that is going to be uh, Social Security and all that other stuff. Now, let's not forget property taxes, which go to the state and local governments. If you have an income tax, or if you have a sales tax in your state, that's going to get it too. So now property tax out of that, uh, you know, the federal government's 18%. Then there's um, $5,000, which is another oh, I don't know, close to 10%, um, you know, 8% that's going out the window. Um, sales tax. Now, you can't tell me there's no sales tax in New Hampshire. I know when you go to Walmart and you bunch of buy, buy a bunch of plastic crap, there's no sales tax. But you go out and eat, there's the food tax, 8%. It might as well be a tax. I mean, most people come here, um, you know, they come to tax-free New Hampshire and they buy meals, pre-prepared meals. There's your 8% there. So you think about the sales tax you pay. Then you start figuring in the gas tax, which is 50, 60, 70% on, in an, on every gallon, um, 70 cents on every gallon. Now, what about these uh, tolls that you're talking about here? And then, you know, the, the amount of taxes that people pay, it's phenomenal. Then start figuring a business can't be a business unless it makes profit, right? So when we tax the businesses, the end customers have to pay the taxes of the business. Otherwise, there's no profit. You know, the, the profit the amount after taxes and after cost of production. So you're paying all the taxes that a business pays. I wonder, are we paying 50%, 60 70% of our income in taxes to the government, whether it's federal, local, state? I'm not sure. It's all hidden in there. It's all intertwined. It's very difficult to tell, but I can tell you you're paying way too much. Apparently there's a mystery emu running around the state of New Hampshire. If you don't know what an emu is, it's like an ugly midget ostrich. So there's a big bird on the loose. Since hikers spotted a lone emu last week, reports of emu spotting have been flowing in. Campers, can you imagine that everybody even knows what an emu is? Campers saw it wandering around the grounds of the New Hampshire Autobahn land con in Concord. There's also been uh, reports of emu sightings in Bow. This bird gets around. By the way, emu's not nice. You don't want to go trying to pet the emu if you see it. 
No one's sure where the uh, giant flightless bird came from, but Autobahn workers guess it escaped from a farm. Probably a good guess. Probably not a house pet. Emus often are farmed for their meat. Rick Maniard, president of the Nash, uh, New Hampshire Autobahn, says, Employees have been calling around looking for local emu farmers. So far, the closest they've had is um, they found is one in Vermont. Scouring the countryside for emu farmers. Another one. The state has asked the New Hampshire Supreme Court to dismiss a school funding lawsuit. Now the land, um, that lawmakers are moving ahead with a new effort to determine the state's share of education costs. So the state has its little taxes it collects from you and the local government has its taxes it collects from you. This is really just fiddling with the numbers. You know, it's all your money. And every time they want something new, whether it's an indoor Olympic-sized swimming pool for the school, or whether it's new uniforms for the football team, or whether they want to fly the debate team out to Santa Cruz for a de national debate, or whatever it is they want to do, it all comes out of your pocket. Whether they're teaching your kids how to put condoms on cucumbers or whatever, it's all coming out of your pocket. Every time, that, you know, all that time that they spend sitting the kids down for roll call and counting them off and you know doing study time in class when the teacher's just sitting there doing nothing grading papers or whatever the, the teacher's doing so that the you know she gives the students busy work all that stuff you're paying for it one way or the other but of course the local government has to argue back and forth they have to bicker with the state and the the courts. I want to tell you real quick about the uh, Live Free or Die rally. It's 7 p.m. to 4 p.m. tomorrow in Joffrey, in the center of town. My name is Mark Edgington. This is the Keene Weekly News. Thanks for watching. Today is August the 24th, 2007. Have a great week.